When I took a class at the seminary titled Issues and Origins, on the first day, the professor stood up and said, in order to really understand the complex relationship between faith and science, you need to have a doctoral degree in biology, chemistry, geology, physiology, uh, all the ologies, really. <laughs> you, um, sociology, psychology, theology, physics, you name it. He, just to name a few. He said, and because none of us have doctorates in all of those fields, we're all just going to be doing the best we can. And so as we dig into this series on faith and science, that's what I'm going to be doing, that's what we're going to be doing, the best we can. Today, the question this morning that we're going to attempt to answer is, did we evolve? And perhaps I should clarify it a little bit more, talking about macroevolution. Did we go through big changes that caused us to become human based off of lower life forms? versus microevolution where, we, you know, having small changes that help us to adapt to our environment and, and various needs. So this question that we're digging into this morning, did we evolve? I want you to think back to when you were in high school, academy. What was popular? What was cool? What was the, the trend back then? Do you, you remember some things that were cool when you were in high school? For me, one of the the coolest things, the, the, at least when it came to fashion, was baggy jeans. Baggy jeans. The baggier, the better. You know, it was your, your, kind of your, your status in school was how big your pant legs could get. You know, I was never cool enough to have jeans that were that baggy. I got kind of close, but, but didn't quite reach that level of coolness. But that was the, the cool thing, to have the, you know, pant legs that you and a friend could fit into, right? But things change. Fashion changes. And I can't imagine trying to go out into the world today wearing baggy jeans in a skinny jean world, right? People will just stare and, and laugh and make fun of anyone trying to wear jeans like that in today's world. Unfortunately, I think that belief in creationism, a belief that we are created, has gone the way of the baggy jeans. It seems that more and more people are finding that idea, that concept, that belief, to be something that is worthy of ridicule, worthy of laughter. And perhaps no more is it worthy of laughter than in the field of, of science in general. It has become so pervasive through science. It's, it's just ubiquitous. Every field of science has some connection, has this belief, has this acceptance of the evolutionary theory and rejecting creationist, creationism. In fact, a lot of people have come to the conclusion that evolution is the most influential idea produced by science. Think about that. Evolution is the most influential idea produced by science. And if you don't agree with this, just do a quick Google search of the, the top most important uh, scientific theories or ideas or scientists, and pretty much every list you come across is going to have evolution at the top. It's going to have Charles Darwin at the top. Evolution is the most influential idea produced by science, and, and that's an astounding thing, statement to make, because science has produced a lot of amazing ideas, influential ideas. I mean, but to think that, that evolution has become more influential than all of the, the modes of transportation that science has produced, planes, trains, automobiles, everything, rocket ships, it's more influential than that. It's more influential than science and than medicine and, and various medicinal treatments. It's been, been more influential than technology even, than computers and tablets and cell phones, smartphones. I mean, can any of you even imagine life without your smartphone or your cell phone now? No, it's just like, how did we ever exist before, right? And, and yet, more than that, evolution has is been even more influential than even 
the phones we have in our pockets or purses. And why is it so influential? It's because this idea of evolution has become ubiquitous in all disciplines of science. You can see the the branches of science up there, earth and space and social science, life science, physical science, formal science, and evolution has infiltrated all of these branches of science. And you can see in, in more detail, sociology, astronomy, psychology, geoscience, biology, chemistry, physics, all of that. Evolution is found in all of these areas. And, and you might think, well, you know, I can see evolution you know, being a part of biology or, or chemistry, perhaps, but, but how is it a part of psychology or sociology, for example? Well, I mean, sociology won't give you an example for everything, but sociology, they think some sociologists, many, most, if not all sociologists, have that evolutionary approach to their science where they th- say things like, well, we're not hardwired for monogamy. You know, it really is unreasonable in the fact that it makes no, there's no reason that we have faithful, committed relationships. Because evolution says that we should just be trying to reproduce with as many uh, partners as possible, to have, you know, have many offspring as possible with as varied genetic background as possible. That's what evolution has hardwired into us. And so the fact that we commit to a husband or a wife, the spouse, for a long term, that makes no sense you know, from a sociological perspective. And so we see this, this train of thought has infiltrated all strains, all branches of science. In fact, it's not just science that has been infiltrated by, by this belief in evolution. Interestingly enough, as I was gathering the pictures for this, the slides this morning, I had a TV show on in the background. It's, a, it's an interesting TV show that goes to, uh, it's hosted by a man named Anthony Bourdain. He's a, a chef, an author, and he goes to various locations around the world, countries or even states in America, and he digs into the local culture and, and experiences the, the local food, the cuisine. It's a, a pretty fascinating show, and I had this playing on in the background, and a new episode started, and the opening line from this episode was this. He said, Some time ago, something crawled or slithered or grew like a fungus. Something that started small got bigger, lurched like a swamp thing out of the mud and moist earth and humid nights of the delta. I mean, this was just a evolution synopsis, right? In a nutshell, starting off this, this culture show, this food show. You, you can't really get away from this idea of evolution in our culture, in our society. So what are we to do? Do we just sit back and think, okay, well, I have to go with the flow. It seems like everyone and everything is is going towards this direction of, of evolution. Is that all that I need to do now? Just put my hands up and, and accept it. You know, there are some that, that do. There are some Christians that have tried to forge a middle ground between evolution and creationism. They call it theistic evolution. And we'll, we'll talk about that later on in our series. But what, what does that mean for us with this pervasive element of evolution in our world, in our society, in our, in our, from, coming from our scientists? It might be a little encouraging, though, to know that there is a growing number of scholars, of in, of the intelligent elite in our world that aren't necessarily believers, that are atheists, even agnostics. There's a growing number that are writing, that are producing materials saying that evolution is not the answer that so many people have thought it was. There are more and more people coming to the realization that evolution doesn't necessarily deserve that that revered status that so many people have given it recently. In fact, one such writer, David Berlinski, he's a a secular Jew, he noted that one of the major issues when it comes to this theory of evolution is the fact that there has never been a scientific theory that has been so completely embraced by the scientific community and so rejected by the majority of the population. Because did you know that even 
in the increasing secular society of the United States that a recent survey has shown that between 60 and 70% of Americans still believe in a higher creative power. So the fact that this theory has been so completely embraced by science and rejected or disagreed with by the vast majority of the rest of the population, it shows that there's, there's a problem there. There's a disconnect there. And the disconnect really is over the, the fact that a belief in evolution is dehumanizing. Because people see that there are, at the heart of this, you know, the, this debate between creationism or evolution, or some people reduce it to science and faith, that at the heart of this, this particular conflict, there's this, this belief that, that when humans, if humans were to have actually come from lower life forms, that that makes a, a real negative impact on the value of people. And, and by and large, people aren't ready to make that leap. They're not really ready to, to lower their, their values of life. Because evolutionists like Joe Quirk write that hominids are all the Neanderthals, Australopithecines, Homo habili, Homo erecti, etc., the upright walking apes of which we are the only surviving species. You know, they say that, that we're descended from apes, we're descended from these lower life forms, and that's what we are. That's all we should expect. That's, that's all that, that comprise what we consider to be life, is just this, these evolutionary steps that have made us who we are. And that presents a really low view of humanity, to think that we have just come as a, a happy cosmic accident from some single-celled organism in a primordial swamp somewhere. Whereas the Bible, on the other hand, in its creation account, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27, it says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image and likeness, and let them rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air, over the tame animals, over all the earth, and over all the small crawling animals on the earth. So God created human beings in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Now this presents the opposite view of evolution, not just in terms of process, not just in terms of the fact that we didn't evolve, but this presents a high view of humanity because it says that we were created with the intention of reflecting the image of God himself. So the question is, what view of humanity do you want to have? Do you want to have a low view of humanity or do you want to have a high view? Do you want to see a reflection of an ape ancestor when you look in the mirror? Or do you want to see a reflection of God? See, the truth is, the driving force that determines something's value is its source. The driving force that determines something's value is its source. What do I mean by this? Well, let's think for a second. Pretend you were in the mall shopping and you came across a really ugly shirt. And you just had to go over to it because you're like, what is this ugly shirt on the, being sold for? And you walk over to it and, and you look at it and you see the price tag. And you see the price tag says $300. And you're like, what in the world? I wouldn't buy this shirt for a dollar, much less $300. Why is this? What is going on here? And as you look a little further, you see the label. And the label says Armani or other designer. And then it kind of makes sense. While you might not buy that shirt yourself, you think, okay, well, I understand. There's going to be someone that is looking for a high fashion shirt that sees this label that has a good reputation and is going to spend $300 for this shirt because it has that label. Because while you might not agree, people attribute value to its origin. If you took that label off and you put a, a Costco Kirkland label on that shirt, it would just be, you would have, make no sense at all, right? 
But because it has that Armani or that designer label on it, you can understand why it is valued as it is. So think of humanity. If you take the label off that says it was designed by God, that you were designed by God, that I was designed by God, and replace it with a evolved from a lower species label, what happens to the value? The value gets stripped away. The purpose gets stripped away. Value is determined by origin. See, the Bible talks about the purpose, the value of life. The Bible says that we are valuable because we are created in the image of God. We bear his likeness. And not just that, the Bible says that our life has purpose, that our life has meaning. Paul, writing to the Christians in Ephesus, in chapter 2, verse 10, he says, God has made us what we are. God has created us. God has imbued us with value. And not just that, he continues, in Christ Jesus, God made us new people so that we would spend our lives doing the good things he had already planned for us to do. That God has created us in his image with the purpose of doing good in this world. This is a way of thinking, this is a way of living that is completely lost, if that label says, made by evolution. And this isn't just a, a belief that is inherent to Christianity. See, I believe, or I know, that, that in every era, in every culture, in every location in this world, there has been religious thoughts. There has been groups of people that have developed religion. Now, these religions don't necessarily agree. Some vehemently disagree. But there is still something within us as humans that understands when we look at the expanse of the stars in the sky, when we look at on the ocean and see the vastness of the waves crashing, that there is something more, that there is something bigger, that there is, there is a creator out there, that there is something that, that creates a spiritual component to this life. And because of that, these religions ha have come into existence. For thousands and thousands and thousands of years, people have been part of, this, of religious systems around the world because there is this, this thread that connects it. There is this, there is this self-evident truth that there is something bigger, something more in this life. And in fact, the writers of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson in particular, he understood, they understood this self-evident truth that is apparent to everyone. In the Declaration of Independence, it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We see this just in this one sentence, this self-evident truth that men are created equal, that people have equality, that were given to them by their creator. Now, there was a difference in theology amongst our founding fathers. They weren't all what we would consider to be evangelical Christians. But there was this self-evident truth that was true to them, that they observed was true to the world, that there was a creator that gave us equality, that gave us value, that gives our lives purpose and meaning. And we see this in Scripture, throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, just one example from the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17, Moses is writing and he says, The Lord is your God. He is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. He is the great God. He is the amazing and powerful fighter. To him, everyone is the same. To him, to God, everyone is the same. Moses is saying, so, so look, understand that God is amazing. God is, is powerful. God is blessing us. And he doesn't, he's not a respecter of persons. To him, we have equality. 
And again, we see that, that same truth repeated in the New Testament. Paul, writing to the, the Christians in Galatia, he writes in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The Bible is clear that God has created us in his image. We have a high view of humanity because we reflect the image of God, all of us. And because of that, we have equality because to God, we are all his sons. We are all his daughters. It doesn't matter our our gender. It doesn't matter our background. It doesn't matter our culture, our race. It doesn't matter to God because we all have that equality. And he's given us that, that equality and he's given us that purpose and meaning in life, to do good, to be a blessing to others. This is the the truth, this is the the value, this is the the view that Christianity, that that God, the Bible gives to humanity. That there is this sense, this pervasive sense of equality. Joel Feinberg, a legal philosopher, he's not a believer, he's a, I believe, a a secular Jew as well. He writes that there is no basis for equal rights because people are not equal, as some are more intelligent, athletic, etc., but it seems like the right thing to do. He says, when you think about it from, from an atheistic perspective, there is no basis for equal rights. There is no reason for, for anyone to think that we are all equal. Because when you break it down, we aren't equal. None of us are are the same as the other. We all have talents. We all have skills. We all have abilities that others don't have. We are all unequal. So, So there is no legal basis if we think that we just evolved from lower life forms. Where does that concept come from? Where do we have that idea that apparently is self evident? Where does that come from? It's not from evolution. It becomes apparent that evolutionists have to import ideas and ideals from creationism in order to truly understand the value of the individual. Because that is not inherent in their own worldview. The fact that we are all equal, the fact that we all have value is not inherent to evolution. And According to evolution, there is no basis for equality. There is no basis to have a just society. There is no basis to have social accountability. And yet, we do our best to have a just society. We do our best to to have laws that, that undergird, that protect the rights of the individual, that stress the equality of the individual. Basically, we have created a government. We have created a system of laws. We live our lives on the assumption of creationism. And in fact, we don't just live our lives on that assumption of creationism. We punish those that don't. We, we prosecute and jail and punish people that live on the assumption of evolution because they don't live up to the high standards that we have created through our laws. They don't live up to the things that we expect of them. And we live, we have these expectations because by and large, we have a high view of humanity and we persecute and punish those that have a low view, that act according to their baser instincts, that live according to the assumption of evolution. See, the driving force that determines something's value is its source. And whether or not we all agree or people even admit the fact that when they see a value in a person, when they see the need for equality, the source of that value, the source of that equality is God. Have you ever brushed your teeth with a hammer? Any of you? No? Nobody? Oh, good, good, good. I'd be a little worried if you had, right? Have you ever tried to pound a nail with a toothbrush? No, 
right? I, I certainly hope not, right? You would be, if you saw someone trying to brush their teeth with a hammer, what would you do? What would you think? Like, what's, stop, what's wrong with you, right? You, you, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> That's not the point of a hammer, right? We would, we would know that they were misusing the hammer. Why? Because we know what a hammer is for. We know that the hammer was created for the purpose of smashing some nails in, or the very, generally speaking, applying force, right? We know that that's the purpose of a hammer. And so we, because we understand the purpose of a hammer, we know why it was created. We know the reason behind its creation. We know when someone's using it right, and we know when someone's using it wrong. Does that make sense? Because we understand the work that went into its production. We understand the reason for its existence. So if I stood at the back of the church after the service and I handed every single one of you one of these tools, I'm sure some of you would ask, what is that for? And I would say, well, you know, I... I don't know, I, I made these because I had some extra scrap metal in my garage and I had a lot of spare time, so I just made a, a few hundred of these, these doodads and I figured I'll just give them, to, give them out. So here, enjoy. And then one of you took it and, and used it as a, a back scratcher. One of, someone else took it and used it as a banana peeler. Someone else took it out into their garden and used it to do some pruning. Would any of these uses be wrong? No, right? I mean, because it wasn't created for a purpose. There was no way for any of us to say, oh no, you're using that wrong. Because it was just there. There was no purpose behind its creation. There was no intended use for it. So any use is, is acceptable. There's, we had no basis to say, oh, you're, you're way, off the, way off the base with that. There's no... You're not supposed to be using it that way. In the same way, if life, if human life just happened, there would be no basis for us to tell someone that they were using life wrong. There would be no basis for us to tell someone, oh, you made the wrong choice. Oh, you did the wrong action. There would be no basis for that because Life is just life, and, and they can use it however they feel free, however they desire. Oh, I have that, this urge to do that, and so it's okay because I'm just here. I'm just a happy accident of the cosmos, and so I can do what I want. And yet, we, again, don't do that. We don't operate that way. We spend a lot of time and energy and money telling people that they are making bad choices, trying to punish people and correct people by telling them they have done the wrong things. They have, there is something innate within us that knows that we just haven't, we're not just here. We're not just able to do whatever we want whenever we want to do it. And this puts us back into that realm of morality. And I know we've talked about this quite a bit recently. It's been a whole sermon talking about morality and, and re referred to it a bit in a previous sermon. So if you have any questions, you know, go back. All the sermons are online. You can uh, check it out there on, on YouTube. But morality is, that, is what's at stake here. Morality is that, that check that, that if you remember when we did talk, had that sermon on, on morality, that that there is real no good explanation, that a satisfactory explanation. The best way that evolutionists can explain morality is that at its heart, it's selfish. It's all about self-preservation. That, that there is no such thing as love. Because even things like love, really at its heart, at its core, is about selfishness. We don't get married out of love. We get married, even though we might feel or think that it's love, it's only love at a surface because really at its core, we get married because of what the partner can do for us. That's the highest that evolution can get when it comes to morality. It's just an elevated form 
of selfishness. And yet that doesn't answer, that doesn't explain some of the feelings that we have, some of the, 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 the draw to do good just for goodness sake. The draw to the call, that whether or not we respond or answer that call, to, to do good not for what I can get out of it, but for what others can get out of it. Maybe putting ourselves in harm's way. It doesn't make sense when, it just come, when we just think about it as an elevated form of selfishness. In fact, it, it's a counter-argument. Morality really is at the, the heart of even this, this question of evolution or creationism. Because the driving force that determines something's value is its source. And if we take God away from being the source of life, if we remove God from the picture and we attribute the source of life to being uh, some... A lower life form that we progressed from, removing God as the source, it has some really horrific consequences. It sets into motion a domino effect that really can be devastating to us personally, to our society, to our world. Most of us, I'm sure, are at least familiar with the name Charles Darwin. He is known as the father of evolutionary theory. He's the one that wrote the book titled The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection that compiled his research, his, his findings, that made the world think about the possibility that we evolved from lower life forms. But did you know that that's not the full title of his book? In fact, most people just refer to his book as a shorthand of the origin of species. And many people don't even know that that's uh, the longer version. But that's only half the title. When he first published the book, you can see uh, the imprints there, a little difficult to see on the, the, the screen, but that middle line there, it continues. It says, the origin of species or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. That Darwin was thinking along the way, that through evolution, there are some races that are better than others. There are some races that were more evolved than others. There are some races that were lower than others. There was this definite element of racism when it came to this evolutionary theory. In fact, Stephen Jay Gould He's a well-known American paleontologist, writer, and influential atheist. He says, and this is an influential big-time atheist speaking, he says biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1859, which was the year when uh, The Origin of Species was officially published. But they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. Once that book was published, once this evolutionary theory began to take hold, there was an explosion of racist beliefs. There was an explosion of racist arguments based, from this, based in this evolutionary theory that there were some people, some races, that had evolved more, that had reached a higher point of existence because of evolution than others. This was a common understanding that was rooted in evolutionary theory. Francis Galton, another English scientist, in fact, he was a cousin of, of Darwin. He was known as the father of eugenics. Eugenics is a Greek word that means high-born or well-born. And this is the belief that we should, as humans, increase favorable traits at the expense of poor traits or negative traits or bad traits. Here's a, a famous picture. It's called the eugenics tree. And if you can read kind of by the trunk, it says, eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. So basically the concept of eugenics is saying instead of just letting evolution take its course and having this person mix their genes with that person and see what happens and, you know, just let it all, you know, it evolution explode in all of its variety, we should stop doing that. 
We should have the strong genes connect with the strong genes and eliminate the weak genes. And this had a very negative result. You can start to see the implications that this might, might bring. And in, in the early 1900s in America, we really took hold of this eugenics movement, a part of our dark past in this country. There are markers around the country like this one, found in, I believe, North Carolina. It's a state action led to the sterilization by choice or coercion of over 7,600 people between 1933 and 1973. And this is actually just a, a small representation. It, this movement, this eugenics movement was spread all across the country. There's plaques like this in, in Indiana. There is, I, I read that there was a, a real horrific example in Mississippi where they found between 60 and 70% of black or African-American women were sterilized without their knowledge because of this view that we need to elevate the good characteristics and eliminate the bad stuff from humanity's gene pool. Others that were included in this eugenics movement or forced sterilization were people that had been convicted of a crime. Sometimes they were serious crimes. Sometimes they were minor crimes. They didn't matter. In some counties, you got sterilized. Some people that had mental issues, again, some were major, some were minor, it didn't matter, you got sterilized. Even poor people, they really did a, a big push to sterilize a lot of those that, were, that had poor, um, low income because obviously it was their fault and so they didn't want to have low income trash meddling, up the, muddling, muddling the pool of genetics. And that's serious. It's, it's horrible stuff to think about. But it doesn't just stop there. In fact, Christine Niles writes in her article, The Sordid History of Eugenics in America, that American eugenics practices went on to influence the Nazi eugenics program, which ended up with about 350,000 compulsory sterilizations from 1934 to 1945, paving the way for the Holocaust. Because people had lost sight of the origins of humanity. This, again, puts us right back into that moral dilemma. Because it is obvious, it is painfully obvious, that forced sterilizations, that genocides, that holocausts, are horrific and have no place in a just society, in a just world. Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14 says, You, God, are the one who put me together inside my mother's body, and I praise you because of the wonderful way you created me. Everything you do is marvelous. Of this, I have no doubt. And there is something that I believe resonates within all of us, whether we're Christian or, or atheist or whoever. There is something that I believe resonates deeply about this verse, of the ideas, the concepts behind this verse, much more than any idea of a eugenics program or forced sterilization, because we see that there is an inherent value in everyone in you, in me. And the driving force that determines something's value is its source. Ty Gibson, Adventist speaker and pastor, I believe sums it up nicely when he says, we notice in human hearts, our own and in other human hearts, that we aspire to something that finds no perfectly satisfying match in our present state of affairs. We're longing for a love, for a dignity that we cannot find satisfaction for in any relations in this world. He says that there is something within us that is searching for a love, that is searching for a value, that is searching for a purpose, that is searching for, for a dignity that, that we cannot find if we look to evolution for the answers. 
that we cannot be satisfied with, with just saying that we came from lower life forms. There is something that is within all of us that, that yearns to take that high view of humanity that says that, that there is something more, there's something bigger out there. There is, there is something that, that loves us and cares for us and has created us. So this morning, the question, did we evolve? I believe the answer is no. Because if we did evolve, if we did come from lower life forms, that would have such a horrific impact in our lives as individuals, in our society, and in the world as a whole. We've seen some of the fruits of that belief played out in our history. And that is not a world that I want to live in. It's not a world that I want to promote. That's not a, a belief system that I think is going to do anything to build us up as a society, as a people. But if we were created, man, that would have the opposite effect. That has the opposite effect. That gives us that, that right high view of Christianity that, that says that you and I are equal. That when we look in the mirror, we see a reflection of God himself and that we can treat others based on that. That we have a, a meaning and a purpose to life and that, that we work together for the good of each other. And that is a world that I want to live in. That is a society that I want to be a part of. Did we evolve? I don't think so. Because I believe in the core of my being that you and I bear the image of God. 